Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Heavy Repping. My name is John Tron Davidson, and I am here uh, doing a bit of sorting because, as you can see from my big pile, um, I have rather a lot of picks here. And because of my working schedule, I haven't been able to sort them out. But today, I'm going to take a bit of time to do that. Now, of course, this is a very long process. And hopefully you will bear with me because I'm going to be talking about some of the uh, pieces that are in this collection and just eulogising about them uh, a little bit because I've got some really interesting stuff in here and uh, I do like these opportunities to share it with you. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin by separating out what we can see and then we're going to take it from there. So items with which we are familiar. v picks that's a woodstock Little fancy little number. We got an Arcanum Warlock. Uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful piece uh, by Nads, and it's the one that we designed together. Um, it's very, very beefy. Let's have a look and see. So, um, it's very kindly measuring in. Uh, inches for some reason which isn't what we want so let's zero that out and open that up so this is 5.67 millimeters which is pretty healthy that's in my goldilocks zone i do like to keep it between two and a half and three generally that is my preferred area there's enough of a balance between power and um, control. So now what we got is this is a pick maniac, uh, aluminium woven through resin. It's a beautiful number actually that. Um, one of his earliest I believe. We've got more V-Picks here. This is a large pointed. Now V-Picks is a very interesting one because Vinny is, is and remains one of the biggest names in picks. And over the years, he has made some of my favourite pieces, including The Mummy and Chubby Mummy. Uh, he specialises in acrylic, and he's recently diversified into Keronite, which is something that's very exciting. Speaking of big acrylic, this is a Superbite Black. Uh, this is actually made from three pieces, um, but I'm a big fan of that. It's one of the first big picks that I got. Now, I'm going to take this time to turn the light on on my ring light here and uh, and see if we can't illuminate this a little further. Yes, very nice. Okay, now because I've done that, now I've found my other warlock. I did have more. I had four of these actually at one time, but I gave one of them to uh, my friend Ollie, who's a big fan, and it revolutionized his guitar playing, and that's all he uses now. So that's very, I think that's very cool, and that's kind of the whole point of why I do this. Now, some of the other things in here, these pink Howling Monkeys. Um, I'm wearing the Howling Monkey 10th Anniversary shirts today. And Howling Monkeys always had a big, a big place for me in heavy repping because the Antonius, which is this piece here, all the Howling Monkey picks are made from Tagua. And this Antonius is um, was the first pick that I ever gave a full rating to at heavy repping. Uh, back in the early rating system blog days. Uh, I still think it's incredibly cool, uh, and I have so much time for Brian's work. Um, he really is uh, a nice lad, and he's always been very supportive of me and what I do, so I can't really complain about that. Now, in the interim, uh, while we are sorting through all of this, you can see there's an awful lot of different makers, and one of the most exciting things about... Um, spreading the box across the table in this manner is that I get an opportunity to rediscover things. So um, it lets me see things like this Plex model, uh, which is oblique beveled. I'm a big fan, of, big, big fan of Pedro's work. Um, I use the Xana nearly every day. Uh, I use my um, Aplex all the time. Um, I absolutely love them. His cellulose acetate work particularly is some of my favorite in the scene. 
Uh, and so I'm always extremely keen to get an opportunity to play those. And that's kind of one of the most interesting things about this, is that going back and revisiting certain makers after a period of time, because everything has fits and starts, everything has um, cycles where I'll use something for a period and then um, not use it for a time and then come back to it and so on and so forth, is that instead of saying, I found my perfect picks and I'm going to continue to use those for the rest of time, I've never been settled in that way and I've always wanted to find something else and the joy of that and the joy of this sort of collection is that I genuinely, truly look forward to playing the guitar more um, when I know I'm going to play different picks. I don't actually get excited about guitars very often uh, in the sense that I have um, some excellent instruments uh, of my own which were made for me by Mike at Odessa. I recently purchased a 90s Japanese Fender Jaguar of which I'm very fond um, but importantly it's very because I've handled so many guitars in my life the ones that really have done it for me the ones that really have changed my whole experience as a musician uh, they are these Odessas um, that I've most recently acquired over the last sort of four or five years and as a result of that because they do exactly what I want and they um, feel very much like my instruments I no longer think about um, guitars in the same way I'm still excited by guitars I still love particularly the early uh, Japanese and mid-period um, sort of late 70s, early 80s Japanese stuff that's always been my, um, my greatest love uh, in the industry it was just so odd uh, because it didn't have um, it didn't have the West's history of guitar making they made many other instruments like the pipa and so on but uh, it from the mid 60s onwards with the sort of advent of yamaha and then moving into the electric sphere uh, japan had its own thing going on um, and it was trying it was both trying to draw from what the west had done uh, with the fenders and gibsons and and so on and epiphone in the early days uh, but also carve out its own niche in the post-lawsuit period. And so that led to all manner of things being made, like the SGV series and the Super Fighters and um, pieces like the Ibanez Artist and, and so on. So uh, this is a very long way of saying I get more excited about interacting with those guitars with certain picks than I do about the guitars themselves. That's really the the crux of this. Now, as we're going on and I'm talking to you, I'm finding lots of pieces. <laughs> That's a, So this piece here, this is a, a an Ace Performance Picks prototype. And this is from when Anthony was starting to experiment with thicker pieces. So the early ones he did, and this is one of the earliest ones I received from him, uh, is this very small well, relatively speaking, small force. Um, this blue one that's asymmetric was the very first prototype of him moving out of his comfort zone. Now, obviously, I have talked many times about the larger um, picks that I've had from him, and particularly the big uh, heavy-duty prototypes, of which I'm extremely fond and use a great deal, uh, including the wonderful home plate prototype I had from him, uh, not that long ago, or what feels like not that long ago, but uh, but it is really wonderful to see that to cut to come across that and say, oh, I remember this. I remember receiving that, and I remember playing with it so much and and learning, learning about the feel of this bespoke material that he uses. The chicken pick stuff that's here. This is some of the earliest. Um, pieces in my collection when I, I really started to move into this collector's sphere. Um, Epo, I believe, I'm right in saying, was the very first person that I interviewed uh, as heavy repping before before we even really got going, before we had the shop and, and all these things. And uh, to this day I remain extremely thankful for that because it set me off on this path. And part of the part of my belief 
in why I, it was it's not necessarily especially difficult to reach out to pick makers is because a lot of people simply never put stock in this trade. Uh, they never put stock in picks or thought it was important or anything like that. However, this mound that's here, even going on the basis purely of what's evidenced um, in front of us at this time, shows how much there is. I mean, this isn't even representative of every maker I own. Um, but all of these are not only differing models of Plectrum, not only are they uh, differing experiences of the same instrument, but they are also individual people. All of these picks here, by and large, with the exception of things like Dunlops and so on, um, are representative of people. So we have um, Esseti, we've got Duncan over at Zen, we've got Paul at Bog Street, we've got Liam at Crows, we've got Trevor at Plextrum, Matt at Stone Age, Alexis at Iron Age, Pedro at Plex, Kelly Nonis, um, we've got Vinny at VPix, we've got Anthony at Ace Performance, we've got Brian uh, over at Howling Monkey, you know, all of these things, Nads over at Arcanum, Jean over at Valley, um, I love these, these are truly wonderful, they're made from bone, uh, cow bone, uh, primarily, although he does ram's horn as well, and these, what, what always sticks in my mind, when I actually have the time to sit down and look at these, is I think to myself about all the different eras of heavy repping, I think about all the different eras of the Black Traverse, and what has come from that? What has what have I learned from this? Um, what have I taken away from it? What were the what were the key people that I spoke to? And it really is remarkable that we have a community like the one we have, um, especially one that is so passionate and supportive, um, because. Every community has drama, not to say the pet community is any different, we just have a lot less of it, I suppose, because there are less of us. Um, but it's always been, it's always been exciting, because when people started to realise, when pet makers started to realise that there were a lot more of them out there than they thought, and they started to talk to one another, what really happened, what was the most exciting part of it, is that people started to talk. They started to talk to one another, they started to learn, and they started to say, oh, right, well, this person is doing this, this person is doing that. What can I take from this? How can I develop my craft off the back of um, this knowledge? Not copying this person, but... I've now seen that this is this is achievable. How can I develop? How can I make myself into a better pick maker? It wasn't a case of saying, oh, such and such is doing X, so I'm going to knock it on the head, or such and such is doing this, and that means that I have to stop, because they're all picks. I mean, they have to be functional. That's the very nature of them. Um, but it is exciting to see it is truly exciting to see how many people have taken this, the concept of this craft, and they've made themselves better. They've really improved how they, from where they started, and I'm very grateful to be um, to be a part of that. Uh, hmm. It's quite interesting as well, finding some of the pics from the earliest days of this and uh, old wharf shop pieces made of carbon fibre um, with all sorts of things going through them. I believe he did a he did a series with brass woven into the carbon fibre, which is quite, um, quite wild, if I might say. So what we're going to do here is I'm making, making lots of piles because I have lots of makers present here. Um, there's a number of picks, well not too many, but there's a number of picks that I, I haven't really used 
um, because I simply wanted to preserve them and also because I do have a number of other pieces from um, the people that made them. So it means that I don't have to use them uh, if I want to keep them in good condition because I, although I love playing with everything I have, I don't always continue to play with it because I would prefer to keep certain pieces for posterity. Um, there are picks that I turn to all the time. Um, I've always been very open about that because it is impossible not to have a bias or to have a personal preference or a predilection for certain things. But what I do try and do is maintain an objectivity. Um, and maintaining objectivity is what lets me do reviews because otherwise I would just say everyone was brilliant and that would defeat the purpose. So I've always tried to make my um, feelings about that uh, not get in the way of reporting on how things really are because at this time as the community uh, stays as it is and it's unlikely to change in the future just because of the nature of how these things are made a lot of things are made to order and so on um, the only way that you can really have any idea uh, what's going to work for you without purchasing it is you have to have somebody telling you exactly what something is like um, to the best of their ability and that in that means using the pros and cons of that it's not simply a case of saying well this is great so you should try it I have to I have to be able to be negative and positive I have to be able to say um, this is good this is not good this is appropriate this is not appropriate and it's only in doing that it's only in making those proclamations and sticking my neck out um, that the scene can advance because it's no good having I'm not a great believer in advertising in that respect I genuinely believe that the best way to um, represent a scene is to represent it it is to say things about its positives and negatives because those positives will attract and repel certain people those negatives will attract and repel certain people and it is important not to fabricate or to present something um, in a light other than its correct light uh, it's power um, off oh very well it's genuine light because if i say to you this is the greatest pick ever made but I don't back it up with anything. What reason do you have to believe me? Yes, you can go on my position and you can say, well, John runs this site and it's all about picks, so he must know what he's talking about. But I never operate on that premise because ultimately, despite all of my experience, I am still simply a voice on the internet. Now, with all that being said, I like to think that I have learned enough um, from all of my experiences with various people in various avenues um, I like to think that I have learned enough to be capable of offering um, correct advice or at least informed advice I think that's a very important distinction to make but um, there's always doubt in one's mind especially when one has the thought processes that I have and many other people do of self-doubt and so on one of the biggest thoughts and the biggest concerns is do I know what I'm talking about? Am I, right, am I really correct about this? Am I really informed enough to give you an, uh, an opinion that you can believe? And it's not about, it's from the point of view that it's not simply about you believing me. I am trying to inform you so that you can make a better choice in your plectrum buying and therefore improve your actual life because that is what Pix did for me. So I do take it very seriously. Um, and of late, there have been incidents where 
it has made me question that. There have been incidents where I've thought to myself, do I know? Do I really know what I'm doing? Do I know what I'm talking about? And I suppose in a way, um, that will subside, but it will never truly disappear because that is the human condition, I suppose. But um, it's always been a problem of mine that I've thought, well, if I know something, everybody must know. And that means that what I know is, is not special or secret or, you know, it doesn't particularly matter. But I think what I've learned over the course of doing this is that that's, there's a lot to suggest that that's not the case. And that the vast majority of people that I speak to have no idea about picks. They don't have any idea about the implications of material or the importance of grip or... why you should choose certain things over other things or why you should consider certain options. Um, but I've always tried to give that to people. I've always tried to make sure that I wasn't leading them down the path or giving them information that wasn't correct because what good is that to anyone? Um, I'm also sensible enough to know when I have gone in outside of my wheelhouse or said something um, that is wrong because that is a sign of actually having, you know, being able to develop and I don't want to, um, I don't want to rob myself of that. But uh, that's why when I look at this and I think to myself, I can look at all of these and know who made them, what they're made from, the first names of the people who made them, where they live, um, why they make them this way, what the positives and negatives are of that, and I think, well, I must know then. So what am I, what am I giving myself a hard time about? But I think it's, it's it is in a, in a way this beautiful Zen piece. Look at that. Absolutely glorious. Glorious wood. Um, with this feather carved into it. So lovely. Duncan always does such amazing pieces. Um, with all of that being said, I must know, because empirically, this information's in front of me and I can access it without referencing other things. So... Far, for, far be it from me to think that I don't have an education in this. I have genuinely done my work. And there's always more to know. Um, there's always more to know. And I would like to know more. I would always like to know more. I really wish, in the grand scheme of things, that um, I'd had more time with Joe Macy. Because Joe phoned me a couple of times and I got to speak to him when he was very very ill and I got to speak to him for a period and uh, I I almost didn't want to talk I, I just wanted to listen to him speak and let him inform me because he knew so much more so much more than I did uh, and than I do and I'm perfectly happy to admit that Joe was um, the ultimate authority on picks and it was only in the very later stages um, of his life and in the uh, information that I gathered after his death about him and, and about a lot of the things that he talked about it was only doing that that I realised how much he knew outside of the world of vintage picks because uh, his whole thing was to learn. He he just he loved it. Uh, he collected modern pieces. He's one of the only other people I've ever seen to possess any zoophoys, and there are not a lot of us around because these picks were not popular. Um, although I love them, 
and I'm very glad I got to speak to Malta before he died, but uh, somebody else that I wish I had done more, I had done more to get to know. Because we're not here forever. And um, I, I really want to make sure that I preserve this information as best I can for people. I think really with heavy repping, that's always kind of been the unspoken um, point of the exercise is to, to pass on the knowledge of the pit community to other people and to let them to let them know about how fantastic it is how um, how wonderful it can be how much it can change things for you there's so many pieces in here that I look at and think I love this and I love its infinity. There's new makers coming out all the time. There's new people coming out all the time. Um, making changes, making developments, making new things. Um, crafting, evolving, discovering. And uh, and really, that's as, as great as it can be, in my opinion. Um, I do like to find pieces where people have developed and they have made themselves more, that they have become more than how how they started and where they started. Um, seeing the honey picks pieces from the early days when they were very simple to the um, incredible colours they do now, the geometry they use now. Um, even uh, watching things like seeing his performance develop from very simple pieces into single um, crystalline pieces like this I think is, is magical and I would love to I would love to eulogise about this for all of time if I'm honest but um, I think we'll call it a day there because this will take me hours and uh, I just want to share all of this with you so I hope it was enjoyable um, if you did enjoy it, leave a note in the comments and I will go back to this because I find it brings me great, great peace. But um, in the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful day. Don't forget, if you're not sure what to do in life, rep hard, rep heavy, and I'll see you soon.